So we have certain clinical scenarios to discuss in infectious diseases. Common clinical scenarios that we face day to day in our clinical practices as internal medicine residents or practicing physicians. So we have certain clinical scenarios that we will be discussing. So these are clinical discussion rather than exam point of view discussions. So our first case is a 26 year old engineering student who presented to the hospital with complaints of fever for 12 days duration. 12 days duration. The patient was in two to the Himalayas when his symptoms started. Fever was low grade with no associated chills or rigors. In the first two days of fever, he also had loose tools for two days which subsided without any treatment. So as fever was persisting, he was treated with suffixing 200 milligrams for three days and there was no relief of symptoms. He did not have any significant comorbidities. He did not report any addictions. There's no high risk sexual contact. The patient has been consuming food from the local dabas during his entire journey. So that is how he's presented fever of 12 weeks. To begin, he had some loose tools as well. No other localizing. On examination, he was conscious and oriented. He was well. His temperature was 101. Heart rate was 80. Her BP was 120-80 and respiratory rate was 14 per minute, which means that the patient is stable. Okay. And there was no lymphadenopathy. The abdomen, there was no palpable liver or spleen. Respiratory system, there was normal vesicular breath sound. There was no added sounds, no crepitations, no wheeze. Cardiovascular system, normal heart sounds, no murmurs. Okay. Then, we did the basic investigations. So his total leukocyte count was 8,600. Neutrophil 61 percentage, lymphocyte 30. Eosinophil 0. Platelet count 1.51 lakhs, something like a low normal. Hemoglobin is normal. MCV is okay. Hematocrit is okay. ESR is 33. CRP is mildly raised, like 12. Malarial antigen is negative. Bilirubin total 1.1. Bilirubin direct is 0.2. Okay, fine, normal. But you have mild elevation in the transaminase levels. ALT and AST are mildly elevated, 89 and 67. Blood urea is 21, creatinine is 1.1. So what do we have here? We have a young patient who has been on a long trip to northern India, presenting with complaints of a prolonged fever. So how do you call it as prolonged fever? There is no definition of prolonged fever as such. But again, like the fever lasts more than maybe a week, you can call it as prolonged week. It's not a standard definition, just for the practical purposes. And then he had diarrhea in the presentation, but diarrhea is not there as of now. He just has fever. And on evaluation, like physical examination, we couldn't find much. Except for that, during the fever time also, his heart rate is not much elevated. Something called as relative bradycardia. That may be a clue, may not be a clue. Okay, not very sensitive or specific for any. And then again, investigations when you come, uh, most of it is normal. The total count is normal. The platelet count is going like low normal and there is mild transaminitis alone. So this is how most patients present to us uh, with prolonged fever. So what all differentials will you keep? And before you go, the x-ray is also provided. So look at the x-ray. Do you see any abnormalities? Don't worry if you don't because it's a normal chest x-ray. There's nothing in the chest x-ray. So what is the clinical syndrome? So the clinical, like every time you have a case in any branch of clinical medicine, make a clinical diagnosis, okay? So the clinical diagnosis is prolonged fever in a patient, minimal abdominal symptoms and no localization. And then based upon that, you try to form certain differential diagnosis. Now, can this be a PUO? Now, there is a tendency among all of us to write whatever fever that presents to us, maybe which lasting for like more than two weeks or three weeks as PUO. Now, PUO cannot be defined that way. PUO has a definite definition. So, the PUO, to be called as PUO, there should be a fever of 101 on at least two occasion, more than or equal to. The illness duration should be more than or equal to three weeks. And there is no non-immunocompromised state as well. Okay, so this is a classical PU. And the diagnosis remains uncertain after a thorough history taking, physical examination, and the following obligatory investigations. So there are a set of investigations. 
Previously, they say you have to admit the patient and investigate for a particular duration of the time to call it as PUO. That has changed now because most of our patients are actually evaluated on the OPD basis also. So, IP evaluation is not a must to call it as PUO. So, any patient who has fever more than 101, two occasions and the illness lasting more than three weeks and non-immunocompromised, okay. And after history taking physical examination and the following basic test, if you do not have a diagnosis, you call it as PUO. So, that includes ESR, CRP, TCDC, platelet count, hemoglobin, electrolytes, creatinine, total protein, alkaline phosphatase, alanine aminotransferase, aspartate aminotransferase, LDH, creatine kinase, ferritin, anti-nuclear antibodies, rheumatoid factor, serum protein electrophoresis, urine analysis, blood culture, urine culture, chest x-ray, abdominal ultrasound, tubercular skill test or interferon gamma release assay. So, these are the minimum amount of investigation that should be done before you call fever as PUO. Now, what do we have? Here, the duration of fever is only around 12 days, okay, and we have not done all the investigation. So, you cannot call it as a pyrexia of unknown origin. So, it is a prolonged fever, but not a PUO. Now, there is another tendency to call whatever fever that is coming to us without a diagnosis to call it as a tropical fever. Now, do not call tropical fever because any fever that occur in a country like us, okay, so our country is this, so it is mostly in the tropics and part of the rest is in the subtropics. So, whatever fever that is coming in India is a tropical fever. So, you can, that does not give us any meaning. So, whenever you write a diagnosis in your case sheet, it should help you to proceed further in terms of investigations and treatment. Writing tropical fever is not going to help because tropical fever can be anything ranging from bacterial infections, viral infections, whatever it may be. So, do not write tropical fever as a diagnosis you have to write a specific differential diagnosis. Now, what are the possible differential diagnoses in this patient? I would think of the following differential diagnosis. There can be more actually. So, this patient has presented with fever, which is prolonged around 12 days duration without any localization and maybe some abdominal symptoms also. Even if abdominal symptoms were not there, any patient who was presenting with fever lasting for more than one week in our country, I would think enteric fever as the first differential diagnosis. So, enteric fever, as you all know, is caused by salmonella typhi, is transmitted fecoorally through contaminated food. And usually, they are present with prolonged fever. Some of the other symptoms can also be there in the form of abdominal symptoms. Abdominal symptoms can be diarrhea or constipation. Sometimes, there may not be any abdominal symptoms as well. So, even though it is called as endric fever, the absence of abdominal symptoms does not rule out endric fever. There can be sometimes physical examination, you may get a coated tongue, you may get a relative bradycardia as we have seen in this patient, but relative bradycardia can be seen in many other conditions. Relative bradycardia was classically described in yellow fever. It is also described in various other infections like leptospirosis, uh, dengue fever, brucellosis, scrub typhus, etc. So, relative bradycardia alone does not give us an answer, but that is a potential clue. There is a relative bradycardia. Enteric fever, definitely I will keep as one possible diagnosis. Next, I will keep extra pulmonary tuberculosis, which is because in India, tuberculosis is so common. The patient does not have pulmonary symptoms. The weight loss and night switch, etc. are not mentioned. So, not a very possible diagnosis, but you will have to keep in mind because sometimes tuberculosis can present in all such ways, okay. It may not have a localizing features also. Sometimes tuberculosis may just have mediastinal lymphadenopathy and there is no peripheral lymph node, the patient may present with pure fever. So, it is all possible. EPTB definitely I will keep and I will do some imaging if I need to, if the initial investigations are negative. Scrub typhus, now look at the name of typhus and typhoid, okay. Enteric fever is also called typhoid fever. So, which means that typhoid is looking like typhus. So, typhus can also be a differential, always a differential for enteric fever. So, scrub typhus is the typhus that is in, seen in our country. It can have prolonged fever lasting up to around 1 to 2 weeks kind of fever can be seen in scrub typhus. Now, scrub typhus usually associated will have severe headache sometimes and myalgias, okay, headache and myalgias. Usually, it is a recursal infection, you get a low platelet count, thrombocytopenia, here the platelet is low normal, okay. 
then you have transaminitis the alt ast will also be elevated and the patients can sometimes develop complications like renal impairment hepatic dysfunction jaundice etc in any way i will also keep scrub typhus as a possibility uh, in fever that is like around 1 to 2 weeks duration especially if the patient have good severe headache and thrombocytopenia and transaminitis okay now infectious mononucleosis now infectious mononucleosis the incidence of infectious mononucleosis in uh, adult population in india is increasing with the increasing sanitation and all uh, previously predominantly it was children who were affected but when the sanitation and everything increases there will be shift in the epidemiology more and more adult cases we are going to see that is what we are seeing in the clinical practice also so imn is always a differential for a fever that lasts for then uh, one week and with uh, even if there is no localizing feature usually like imn may have symptoms of pharyngitis they may complaints of throat pain and on examination you may also see a, a membrane over the tonsil and then you have posterior cervical lymph nodes which is common in infectious mononucleosis uh, we don't have lymph nodes here so that is against imn but sometimes lymphadenopathy may not be there splenomegaly and hepatomegaly can also be seen but not always but then in the peripheral smear or in the differential count you see a lymphocyte predominance but that is when you suspect so the you have a patient with fever and they have some transaminitis also which is common in infectious mononucleosis plus they have a lymphocyte predominance in the dif in the differential count here if you see even if the counts are normal the dif the lymphocyte percentage only 30 percentage so uh, that is not uh, something that will favor infectious mononucleosis as a differential diagnosis so i am and i will keep low in the doubt malaria can it be malaria malaria yeah it can present with fever associated there's no chills and rigor mentioned here but still uh yes being in northern india malaria is definitely a possibility but we have done a rapid malarial test and the rapid malarial test usually has a good sensitivity to detect malaria so uh, definitely that one test doesn't rule out always if you don't get a diagnosis you may repeat it you also do a, you may also do a peripheral smear but uh, so the rapid test is negative you will keep it in the lower down in the differential diagnosis leptospirosis leptospirosis can usually present with fever which lasts around for one week if not treated and in the second week also there can be a small second spike as well but usually the fever of leptospirosis lasts less than one week the duration goes more than one week you have to keep other differentials you should also look at the counts also in leptospirosis we expect the total count to be elevated it's a bacterial infection thrombocytopenia platelet should go down here it's almost low normal but you expect a more thrombocytopenia in case of leptospirosis and if you look at the liver function test there will be increase in bilirubin so bilirubin also will be elevated in maybe normal in mild leptospirosis but usually when a patient presents to a hospital with such a prolonged duration uh, elevated bilirubin should prompt us to think of leptospirosis along with there will be a transaminitis as well so alt ast will be modestly elevated okay so in 100 300s 400s that can differ it's not about 1000 usually bilirubin also may be elevated and bilirubin elevation some can be un conjugated plus conjugated so conjugated fraction also can be elevated both fractions can be elevated in leptospirosis so usually uh, so that is something that we have to keep the bilirubin elevation and modest transaminitis and creatinine so kidney impairment is again typically seen in uh, severe leptospirosis so whenever you have a fever maybe lasting for a week or like less than one week and the patient have severe myalgia and they have elevated torque count low uh, platelet count a high bilirubin, a high creatine with elevated transaminitis level, one of the differential that you have to keep is leptospirosis. But here we don't have these features, this patient is clinically well, uh, the fever has become around 12 days, that much duration is unlikely for leptospirosis. Thrombocytopenia has not yet occurred, it's only a, still a normal platelet count, creatine is not elevated, bilirubin is normal, it's only mild transaminitis. So I won't keep leptospirosis as a possibility here. Can it be dengue? Dengue as sought for leptospirosis, a fever usually lasts for five days at the maximum seven days. It doesn't go beyond that. It's usually five days of illnesses. Now, dengue can present with fever, but uh, again, as told, when you look at the investigations, in dengue fever, what you usually see is a leukopenia. Here, there is no leukopenia and there will be significant thrombocytopenia also. So, we don't see thrombocytopenia also. Considering the duration of illness and the lack of leukopenia, lack of thrombocytopenia, I wouldn't consider dengue fever as a differential in this particular patient. Mm -hmm.